Okay, so good morning to everyone. It's uh, 10 o'clock sharp here in Munich today. Uh, and welcome everyone to the first of our two webinar sessions today on maritime trends to watch in 2022. This, uh, we have two sessions today. Uh, this first one uh, right now, this morning, is with a focus on Hull. And then we have another session, a similar format, but with a focus on cargo later today. You are, of course, welcome to join both uh, if you are interested. And uh, just to advise you as well that this session is being recorded for replay and download on our website uh, later if you wish to do so. So uh, moving on to uh, the uh, first slide uh, and the agenda. But before we dive in, so I am just a brief introduction. I'm Ulrich Cardo. Global Head of Marine at Allianz Global Corporate and Specialty. On the line with me today, we have two colleagues from Allianz Risk Consulting, Captain Rahul Khanna and Captain Anastasius Leonberg. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Justus Heinrich, who is our Global Product Leader for Marine Hull. Uh, in particular, uh, since this first session is with a focus on Hull, Justus will be the one deep diving into some of the topics specific to that uh, line of business. Our agenda today will cover details of our latest shipping loss data. That take three topics for a more in-depth review. Uh, COVID-19, larger vessels, and uh, climate change. And following that, we'll look at the insurance outlook and hopefully then we'll finish off with uh, lots of time for live Q&A. Uh, you do have at the bottom right of your WebEx session, there should be a section where you can already throughout the presentation, submit questions. And then uh, uh, towards the end of the session, we'll be uh, doing our best to go through as many of them as we possibly can. So please feel free to submit questions as we go along, or of course, later on when we go into our Q&A session. So if we move on to the next slide, um, as I just mentioned on the agenda, we have uh, as a first topic uh, the uh, the uh, shipping losses data, and then also a few others following that. All of that is coming from our Allianz Safety and Shipping Review 2021 report. Uh, so we released this report just a few weeks ago. Uh, it's one of our market leading publications specific to the maritime industry, and uh, there's quite an extensive annual analysis of total losses, uh, incidents and in shipping, and then we enhance this with our expert knowledge and then ultimately publish this, this report. And we did do so just a few weeks ago um, this year. Uh, this report is not the first one we do of this kind. Uh, we've been doing this now almost for 10 years uh, and uh, with the first report being published in uh, 2012. And as I said, it does highlight some of the key industry trends and insights uh, as we see it and as we make sense of, uh, of the data and the losses that we have experienced as an industry. And we're also going into some of the emerging risks. Uh, I would really encourage you to take a look at this report. It is uh, uh, available for download for free. Uh, you do see the link uh, on the slide here on our website or just you know, go on to agcs.allianz.com and I'm sure you can navigate your way towards finding this report. Okay, so with that short introduction, then I'd say we dive right in to the to the first topic on shipping losses uh, data. And that topic will be covered by our, by our global head of uh, Allianz Risk Consulting for the maritime industry, Captain Rahul Khanna. And with that, over to you, Rahul. Thank you very much, uh, Ulrich. And good morning, good afternoon to everyone, wherever you are. Um, very good morning to all of you from a very sunny in London. Quite unusual, but uh, we'll take it. Uh, just going into what we what we do in the shipping loss data, just to, some basics on what is this loss data all about. Uh, we pick up total losses only uh, for the main primary analysis of, uh, uh, of the shipping industry. This is simply because the incident, which might cover all sorts of other uh, uh, casualties like collisions or groundings or fires, uh, the data on that isn't conclusive and it's not very accurate because of the reporting issues across the world. So the total loss data is something which is a lot more accurate, which we use to make these analysis year on year. 
if you look at the next slide, please. This is a summary slide for our uh, safety and shipping review 2021. Um, we'll quickly go through some of these aspects and then uh, look at some details in the further slides to come. Last year, uh, this is the, the total loss. And let me just say that uh, the total losses that we are considering, uh, the time period that we are considering is calendar year 2020. And it obviously takes a while <clears throat> for this data to be collected, processed, and analyzed. And uh, then we release the report somewhere in the middle of 20 or the year after uh, the data is collected. So 2020 year calendar year data showed that we had 49 total losses in, in the year which is uh, a 50% decline over the last uh, date, over, over a decade. Just over a decade ago, we used to consistently have more than 100 total losses uh, across the shipping industry. And uh, in the past 10 years, the shipping industry has, uh, at least in the total losses segment, shown a remarkable improvement in bringing the total losses down by 50%. Overall, in the last 10 years, we saw 876 total losses. Out of the 49 vessels that were lost last year, 18 were cargo vessels. And as with every year, we have seen cargo vessels are the category which are most impacted and feature in the top of all the type of vessels that are lost. Uh, 18 cargo vessels lost in 2020 obviously means uh, more than one third of the vessels that are lost are cargo vessels. And with cargo vessels, we mean uh, general cargo vessels, multipurpose vessels, reapers, uh, and that category. We also look look at the total shipping incidents, and this is just to compare how many incidents year on year we see across the globe, across all types of ships. And 2020 saw 2,703 shipping incidences, which is a 4% year on year uh, drop from 2019, and which is a good sign that the incidents in general have been dropping. Um, but, uh, uh, but we need to be careful because still 2,700 is still a very high number. Some of the other elements that we will cover in this cover in the analysis is uh, the size of the vessels, as already mentioned in the agenda, and of course the impact that COVID has had in the shipping industry. If you go to the next slide, please. Let's have a quick look at the the trend. As I was mentioning, this is a ten-year downward trend on total losses in shipping, and as you can see, for the past three years, 2018, 19, and 20, the total losses have been hovering around the 50 mark. Whether we have reached a plateau or not, uh, the only time will tell. But this seems to be a, a sort of a stable position that the industry has reached. But can't take anything away from the industry that over the years we have shown remarkable improvement in bringing down the total losses and marching towards a much safer shipping industry. Of course, we would hope that these this trend downward trend continues. Um, but of course, it'll require a lot of effort across the industry because going down further is going to be a lot more. If you look at the next slide, we look at total losses uh, by the regions and consistently over the last 10 years, we've seen South China, Indochina, Indonesia, and Philippines, that region come up at top. On the right hand side, you see the 10 year charts uh, of, of these uh, total losses by region. And consistently, as I was saying, this region has stopped the, the, the chart for two, with uh, 274 total losses. This is followed by East Mediterranean and Black Sea, where we have seen 126 losses in 10 years, followed by Japan, Korea, uh, and, and North China. And in the fourth place, we have British Isles, North Sea, English Channel, and the Bay of Biscay with uh, 62 total losses. On the left-hand side, you can see, again, this year by far, um, South China, Indochina region has, has uh, been the region where we found maximum number of losses. If you go next slide, please. We slice and dice the data in different categories, and here we can see which types of vessels were um, were the ones which were lost. So out of the 49 total vessels lost in 2020, we can see 18 were cargo vessels, and as I said earlier, this is this means that uh, more than one third of the vessels that were lost were, were cargo vessels, followed by fishing vessels, uh, 10 in number overall. But over a 10-year period as well, we have seen maximum number of vessels that are lost have been cargo vessels. This doesn't come as a huge surprise to many who are in the industry because cargo vessels in general, we see uh, a lot of procedures, a lot of uh, uh, regulation that apply to them are less stringent than some other categories, for example, tankers. We look at the next slide. 
Can we go to the next slide, please? So here in this in, in this one, we look at uh, all casualties and incidents, including total losses. So when I mentioned that we look at incidences as well, here we can see how these incidences have panned out over, over last year and also over the 10 years. Now, in this case, we have East Mediterranean and Black Sea topping the regions for, for the last 10 years with over 4,500 4, incidences. You have to, we have to remember that when reporting incidences, uh, there is a, a big, big inconsistency from the regions where the incidents have been reported. Some regions, for example, are a lot better in reporting instances and some obviously not so. And that is the reason why we take total losses as a concrete measure of measuring the performance of the industry and do not go by the casualty incident. But this certainly does give us a trend of where we are trending. And, and so far, it seems that uh, the trend for over the years is also uh, sort of plateauing within this 2,000 to 2,500 incident mark, which is definitely a good sign for the industry. If you go to the next slide, please. So we, as we mentioned, we, we will look at a couple of uh, impacts the, uh, on the shipping industry that has uh, uh, that we have highlighted in the report. And nothing beats the impact that COVID-19 has had on the globe as a whole, but especially on the shipping industry, there are a few elements where COVID-19 has had very big impacts. And uh, we'll look at some of those. There are quite a few of them, but we'll pick up a couple of them in this, uh, in this short webinar. In the next slide here, we see uh, one of the, the fundamental and one of the key impacts for COVID-19 has been on, on the crew, uh, on the crew seafarers and seafaring community and this humanitarian crisis, which has been brewing for almost close to one and a half or two years now, has meant that they are the, uh, they are the ones who have been impacted uh, in, in the worst way. What we have seen over the years, uh, over the last year and a half is that more than 200,000 seafarers have been impacted uh, in the sense that they have not been able to go back to their homes uh, after the completion of their normal time period on board ship. And in some cases, this has gone up to more than a year that these that the crew members have been on board these vessels. Working on board ships is already stressful. It's a high risk environment. And when you have to stay there or, or twice as much as longer as you normally would with the fear of your families, their safeties, their health and safety, uh, it becomes a situation where there is immense mental stress and fatigue on the seafarers. Now, this humanitarian crisis um, has been highlighted time and again by the shipping industry. And uh, it, is, uh, it is the fact that uh, 700 different companies and organizations signed up to a Neptune declaration, which, uh, which was signed somewhere in the middle of last year. And the Neptune declaration essentially lists the things that industry as as a whole should be doing to address this crisis now some of the things which are mentioned in the neptune declaration are that seafarers should be given essential worker status in some countries like in the uk this has already been done some of the other countries have followed suit but a large part of the world still remains uh, oblivious to this fact that seafarer and seafaring community is the one which was running the globe while everything else was shut down during covid 19. the essential supplies uh, which were which were being transported all across the world was only possible because seafarers were on, on board these vessels running them 24 7 as they do today but the the horror stories that we have seen over the last year about how crew members have not been able to go home in spite of deaths in spite of the family's suffering uh, has been something that uh, needed urgent attention in spite of neptune declaration where 700 companies have come together the problem still exists the other part of the problem is that the ports and terminals still are not allowing crew change. Many of them still are resisting that, and that is exasperating the problem of, of uh, the seafarers. And over the past few years, we have said that that 70% uh, uh, or more of, of losses come from human errors or are linked to human error in some cases. And such extreme mental stress on the seafarers can, can only lead to uh, and upward trends in those losses, which we must as an industry avoid. We have done so well over the years, and we don't wish we should not be going into a, a situation where we end up losing all the gains that we have made in safety because we could not address this issue. The other uh, couple of uh, major issues that we have seen uh, and which have impacted the shipping industry because of COVID, uh, the first, I think, one uh, which comes to mind is, of course, the cruise ships industry. The cruise ship industry or the passenger vessel industry has really suffered. 
um, especially last year, a lot of them, pretty much all of them were, were laid up uh, in the hope that they will, they will be deactivated in a few months and come back into service, but that really didn't happen. Some of some sections, some smaller sections, some river cruises did come back in the middle of the year, uh, late part of the year uh, and earlier this year. But again, because of concerns, safety concerns, they were back uh, into a layout. So this section of the industry has really, really suffered. And we can only hope that uh, with, with the vaccination status across the world, with the borders opening up a little bit and some relaxation, this, this section, a section of the industry can come back. And last but not the least, uh, the biggest problem that we are facing today and one of the big talking points in the industry has been the supply chain disruption that has happened. Now, how is that, how is that related to COVID? Of course, when the pandemic started, the manufacturing hubs in the East, in China uh, and, and Malaysia and Indonesia and all those places uh, were shut down. And even before the pandemic stuck, the, the manufacturing of new containers uh, was at a, at a low because of the trade uh, issues that were going on between the, the Western world and China. That meant that we had less containers in circulation even before the pandemic. But when the pandemic hit, a lot of these manufacturing hubs uh, were shut down and we could not uh, send the vessels up. Uh, the, the goods that were manufactured in, in China were stopped. The demand on the West uh, in, in, the, in the United States and Europe fell down quite quickly and quite drastically in the first few months. But then something unexpected happened that the demand suddenly peaked up because of we were all sitting at home ordering stuff from Amazon, left, right and center, and the demand suddenly peaked in the middle of the pandemic late last year. We saw an uh, exceptional amount of uh, uh, orders, and container suppliers and finished goods uh, demand coming in from the Western world, uh, uh, not just Western world, within Asia as well. And that meant that the containers that never reached to, to these places in the first place were now displaced. We have more than 400 vessels, more than 300 vessels in June 2020, by June 20, stuck at different places in the world at different ports waiting to be, to be get on. And uh, all this meant that we had to, uh, uh, we have a situation where container prices and, and uh, the cost of shipping a container, for example, from China to Los Angeles went up four to five times. What used to cost $2,000 now costs up to eighty to $20,000 for a container to be shipped. And this has meant that a huge amount of uh, smaller supply uh, consignees and smaller uh, industry who were depending on and never factored this excep exceptional cost increase are, are now finding it so difficult to send up their goods across the world. And this at this we have also seen the impact is going to be within uh, our daily lives where we see delays in supply chain, the, the supermarkets do not have enough goods, and inflation is, is unfortunately one of the other results that we would see from this. How do we address this issue? I think the, one of the things that is happening is that the container order book, the new container ship order book is at a, at a seven to eight year high. So many containers are on order at this time. But if you listen to the experts, some of them are saying that this crisis is not going to be solved in a hurry. This might go well into 2022. We all hope that this is not the case because at the moment the ports are choked, especially in, in the Western coast of the United States. We are seeing 30, 40 large container vessels still waiting to enter. And the time, the waiting times of container vessels has doubled what it was since 2019. So this is a major impact and this is still brewing at, at, as we speak. And there are not easy solutions inside. In the inland container hubs, there are thousands and thousands of container, empty containers piled up, which need to be back in the manufacturing hubs, but they cannot be there because of uh, the supply chain issues that we have. If you go to the next slide, please. The other thing that we were focusing on are, is the is the larger vessels. We've repeatedly said in our reports in the previous years that with larger vessels come disproportionately larger risks to the industry. I mean, shipping industry and uh, would, has rightly used the economies of scales. Uh, and for that reason, the vessels have become larger over the years, which the insurance industry and other industries, other related uh, parts or elements of our shipping industry has supported because it makes sense. However, the additional risk that we have from uh, from these larger vessels means that we somehow missed uh, a, a key focus on how we should be mitigating the risk that come along with the increasing size of these vessels and some of these mega ships. You go on the next slide, please. This graph actually 
quite nicely depicts how the container ship uh, size has grown over the last 50 years. I mean, back in 1968, uh, when the first container ship came out, it was a 1500 TU vessel, quite large in those terms in, uh, in, in those days. But then I remember back in uh, the years when I was sailing in, in 2005, 2007, uh, a 5000 TU container ship used to be one of the large container ships. But today we are talking about 24,000 container vessels. And these are uh, mega vessels, as you've seen. You might remember a certain vessel called Ever Given blocking the Swiss Canal in the, in the last few months, making, making history or making headlines all over the world. Uh, and this is one of the issues that we have highlighted since uh, since last three to four years, as the size of these container vessels have gone up by 1,500% since the time it started and doubled in the last 15 years itself. Together with the size, uh, with these economies of scale, with these efficiencies that the industry is trying to put forward, the risks that are come along are also plenty. We'll go on the next slide, please. We can see a few of the key issues that have uh, that have come across with larger vessels. Of course, one of the one of the big problems that comes with these larger vessels is the complexity. If these vessels end up in a casualty, we have seen in so many instances in in the last few years where these mega vessels have been involved in casualties, and the scale of the casualty has very quickly uh, escalated to to a degree where the vessel was eventually lost, uh, and the salvage uh, salvage resources. The resources that are needed to tackle such uh, uh, casualties on these vessels are disproportionately larger and difficult. And if the, the the situation becomes a lot more complex, if the casualty happens in a slightly remote remote area where these resources are even more difficult to find, uh, one of the big problems that we've seen over the years on these mega vessels is, is the fire claims that has happened, and this has been happening in the last few years, uh, and the trend unfortunately has been rising. In 2019, we saw one fire every 10 days on one of these on the container vessels, and 2020 wasn't far behind. We are seeing one fire every two weeks on these vessels, and the cost associated with these instances are also enormous. As we have seen, these usually run into hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more. We are still trying to uh, trying to assess damages from some of the key some of the big losses that have happened in the last few years. I think at this point, uh, I will hand over to my colleague uh, Anastasios, who would talk about the uh, the further issues that we have seen in the larger vessels and also about the next topic that we have on climate change. Anastasios. Yeah, uh, thank you, Raul. I'm proceeding now with the spike in uh, container losses. So container losses at sea spiked last year and have continued at a high level in uh, 2021 disrupting the supply chains and posing a potential pollution and navigation risk. The rise in container losses at sea is driven by a combination of potential factors. And uh, last year in 2020, uh, more than 3,000 containers were lost at sea. So coming uh, to the last topic on this slide, the, the vlogs. So I won't cover it in details, but it is included in the report. Uh, flocks, so very large ore carriers, can pose a higher than usual exposure due to the risks of cargo liquefaction, structural failings, and the added challenge of uh, salvage and wreck removal. So if you'd like to know more, get in touch with us, or you can just ask a question in the Q&A session. Please, the next slide. Climate change. It is expected that the international shipping industry's share of total global CO2 emissions increase in the coming years due to world trade demand, increased shipping activities, and due to increased emission mitigation in the other industries as a consequence of public opinions and regulations. So climate change has been nothing than a wake-up call for the shipping industry to reduce shipping emissions. The next slide, please. Efforts uh, to reduce emissions need to move up a gear while ESG reporting requirements will increasingly impact. I don't know if everybody is familiar with ESG. ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. ESG criteria are a set of standards for companies' operations that socially conscious investors use to screen potential investments. So environmental criteria consider how a company performs as a steward of nature. 
So it's an indicator for investors. Uh, the transition to uh, low sulfur shipping has gone well to date, but has also brought machinery and fuel damage claims and fire risks. And uh, the last point is, meanwhile, sailing in the Arctic waters continues to make waves, but means unpredictable conditions, significantly higher environmental and salvage costs in the event of an incident, and the lack of detailed voyage and hydrographic data. So, to the first bullet point, firstly, and a most important topic that we have seen covered a lot at the London International Shipping Conference last week, the pressure to cut global shipping emissions mounts. So the international shipping industry produced just over 1 billion tons of greenhouse gases in 2018. Also, momentum gathering behind international efforts to tackle climate change, the industry is likely to come under increasing pressure to accelerate its efforts. The second point, uh, which is mostly done, uh, IMO 2020, so transition to low sulfur shipping. The transition to low sulfur shipping has been smoother than many predicted and expected, though there have been some issues with bunkering and the use of scrubbers. Insurers, so we have seen a number of machinery damage claims related to scrubbers. And finally, the last topic is Arctic shipping. So Arctic shipping requires new ways to manage risks. The shipping activities in the Arctic region grew 25% over six years. Sailing in Arctic waters poses a number of risks. So in the event of an accident such as grounding or fire, the cost of salvage and environmental impact could be considerably higher than in non-Arctic waters. So I think I hand over to Ulrich. Yep, thank you, Anastasius, for that uh, overview on climate change. Obviously, a topic we could easily spend a full hour on, um, but um, uh, the highlights are uh, covered well by you, Anastasius. Thank you. Uh, so we'll we'll move on uh, to I think the uh, last topic of our agenda before we go into Q and A, which is the insurance market outlook. Um, and for that, uh, with a specific focus on Hull, as I mentioned earlier. Justus, uh, Justus Heinrich uh, will take over. So Justus, I'll hand over the mic. Thank you. Yep. Hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining in and for uh, showing interest in our shipping and safety review and uh, our general view on market. Um, yeah, the IUMI conference just finished and uh, we have seen some interesting figures there and I would like to refer to IUMI figures as well uh, when we talk about high premium. Uh, where we see a volume of 7.1 billion US dollar in um, our world book uh, globally across the market. But the gap between the world fleet grows and the premium is still obvious despite these positive trends uh, we, we have heard in the one or the other um, a part of um, Raoul's session. In particular, on container vessels, we see a strong increase in values, and with this, a certain inflation also with an impact on premium quality. Another factor for value increases in future will be the new build demand versus capacity available at shipyards. Also, I will refer to that briefly, as we can expect um, still a growing demand and trade capacity. AGCS's focus in hull insurance will so continue to be on frequency and um, frequency loss level and also the pattern of those frequency losses. We assume, supported by IUMI conference statements, that there has been a positive impact also linked to COVID due to less trade and due to less vessel activity. Another important market trend is the activity on green and alternative fuels, where also we as insurer will need to learn about impacts on loss pattern, in particular linked to machinery. Maintenance requirements for shipping companies will possibly change in line with that. Last but not least, the market, meaning insurance brokers and our clients, has increasingly to deal with geopolitical implications. Sanction regimes such as OFAC, demand for enhanced communication and transparency level, and the dialogue is even more important to make sure that due diligence requirements are met. So 
we need to keep talking about those things in our renewals with brokers and clients. We will continue to see exclusionary language not only on cyber and communicable disease, but possibly also linked to certain trade. So again, here communication is key, and the more transparency we can get in our talks, the better we can address this in our wordings. Key things we can take from the data from an underwriting perspective, as stated by our ARCs earlier, fire losses are a key driver. Linked to that, increasing vessel size, mainly container vessels, means also an increasing accumulation risk, not only for cargo insurance, but also for hull. While we see, confirmed by our UMI conference statements, that TLO losses are still decreasing in numbers, that there's also a positive trend in terms of claims frequency, increasing claim costs linked to fire, for example, engine room fires we have seen over the past months, is endangering this trend when looking at loss ratios. Our ARC is closely working together with the claims and underwriting teams, and we explicitly like the exchange with our assurance on possibilities to enhance risk management and identify lessons learned, including a better control of accumulating risks. We also need the support of our brokers to further intensify this. To make the next step, in risk analysis and pricing, we won't only take our own historical claims and vessel data, I will refer to that also in his speech on TLO, but we'll consider new KPIs and data from external sources. Our clear target is to be more specific on individual risk profiles when it comes to pricing and to enhance transparency on that. So this is, uh, in brief, the underwriting perspective on on market. Okay, thank you, Justus. Uh, and with that, we are uh, a bit more than 30 minutes into the call um, and now moving on to Q&A. So uh, of course you can ask questions on anything that was said or presented, uh, or if you've read the report, uh, then of course any detailed questions on that are welcome um, or more general on the industry uh, perspective uh, we have the experts on the phone so we're happy to take those um, to submit your question uh, on the bottom right of the webex screen there should be a section called q a which you can expand and then just uh, type in your question so if you think of something please go ahead and uh, do so. We do have a few questions uh, submitted uh, already. So uh, as you're thinking of what you may want to ask, I'll just uh, start. Uh, so one question was, was asked, not specific on content, uh, whether the slides uh, can be shared afterwards. Um, and uh, maybe uh, our communications colleagues can comment on to what extent we will make this available. Um, I do believe the slides uh, will be shared, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there's also uh, the possibility of download uh, of this session on our internet. Um, okay, so if there's anything else the comms colleague will want to share, then please chime in, otherwise I'll dive into the next, next question. Okay, so uh, another member asked here, uh, or participant of the call, uh, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on the uh, marine claims environment? Um, so that's, uh, that's a good question. So um, maybe Justus, you can comment uh, since the focus is on Hull uh, for this uh, section, a little bit on what we, uh, uh, what we have seen or heard in the market regarding COVID-19 and uh, marine Hull claims. Yeah, sure. Um, so what we um, have seen in terms of claims costs is that um, even if there is a lower frequency in number of claims, claims costs were rising um, in particular due to waiting time uh, until the vessel can go into yacht, um, into the yacht, repair yacht, uh, for example, in, in case of loss of fire. Also, um, uh, the um, supply chain delays uh, have shown increasing costs in repair. Um, cost. So um, these these are all factors we have seen during during COVID, and also 
as a matter of fact, when uh, um, slots are um, uh, say difficult to get, uh, yard prices are increasing. So um, these these were for sure claim cost drivers during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and maybe just to add from from my perspective as well, COVID. I mean. Uh, the virus itself, I mean, most of the health policies uh, do have an exclusionary language for communicable disease now implemented. I think this has been a market trend now for, for quite a while, but the number of claims uh, specific on health policies to COVID, I think, has been very, very small. Uh, um, you know, the area, you know, where, they, where uh, there was some exposure and where we've seen a few losses uh, was on the loss of hires so the business interruption and income. Um, and uh, I guess that's probably true for the industry in general as well. Um, we have a next question here, which uh, which I think is an interesting one uh, from one of the participants. Uh, how do you ensure premium quality remains stable uh, when insured values have increased by 300% or more? So I guess this is, again, a bit of an underwriting question. Uh, so Justus, I'm putting you at the edge of your seat, um, yeah. if it's okay. Um, it's something we have to deal with uh, every day, I must say. And um, as uh, some of you might know, uh, our wordings have, um, in most cases, fixed um, uh, rates agreed for, for increases. So a certain factor has to be applied when uh, values are changing. And it's now an increasing matter of negotiation to deviate from that, because as you rightly say, when uh, values are increasing three or four times, you can't continue to work with these fixed rates um, to reflect it in, 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 in terms of premium. So this is also what we refer to uh, when we said, um, or when I said certain inflation on premium can be seen, because it's, uh, on the one hand, uh, the frequency loss we have to cover, on the other hand, it's also the uh, uh, limit uh, we, we have to cover. So um, the premium quality um, on, on, on that side is for sure inflating due to that. And it's a matter of negotiation to, to make it short. Yeah. And what I would add to it, I mean, if the prices for vessels increase, it also the prices for uh, parts of the vessel or, re or repair because of steel prices rising and inflation that you just mentioned increases, of course, this will have to have some impact on uh, on premium levels, right? So, so expecting that uh, insurance premium remains stable while uh, the prices for the assets that we do insure creep up, uh, that's just not possible from an economical perspective uh, um, uh, to do that. Uh, but what I would add to it as well is as we are spending a lot of time investigating what is really most indicative of exposure uh, when we look at understanding and pricing uh, hull risk then uh, then what's interesting is that actually the total vessel value is just one of many uh, indicators and and variables that uh, that depicts exposure there's also many others uh, that we take a look at very very closely that are uh, very, very closely correlated to claims that we see in our data. So, um, uh, so overall, if the total sum insured goes up, then yes, that will have an impact. But there's also many, many other factors that uh, that uh, make up exposure and drive the price. And uh, overall, sums insured is is not not the only one. Um, okay. Good. So, um, what else do we have? Um, there is another question here uh, from a panelist member. Um, being more specific when it comes to premium binding, does it mean that the individual underwriter at the AGCS at AGCS has more margin at renewals? So, Justus, again, this is we uh, you know. Of course, uh, the, the short answer is no, but but uh, maybe you want to uh, e expand a bit further. So you already set the tone, Ulrich. Thank you. Um, I mean, the underwriter at AGCS had always the margin to negotiate depending on the performance of an individual client. But when looking at the general premium level available, 
driven by the premium developments over the past years and I would say decade. Uh, the margin is simply set also by facts and not only if the underwriter would like to have some more room to maneuver or if we want to make our clients and brokers more happy. If you want to have a reliable insurance panel, uh, we need to be all aware and to accept that there is still a way to go from an AGCS perspective to achieve sustainable premium levels. So while we are clearly saying that we are very keen to attract new accounts and to be uh, very open for, 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 for new business, it's key for us to keep our portfolio healthy. And due to that, every underwriter will be very mindful with the room to maneuver he has. And the answer is clearly there is room to maneuver. And the key indicators are premium quality as such compared to our benchmarks and compared to what we will develop in future, as we briefly touched up on, and the individual loss performance. Very good. Okay, thank you, Justus. Um, there's another interesting question. Maybe this goes to our uh, risk engineers, uh, which was, do you feel that the ongoing and growing congestion we see worldwide has had an impact on proper container packing practices? And if so, how? So, Rahul, maybe yeah. that's something that, that, that you're... Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, certainly we have uh, we have seen this, and uh, we get quite a lot of uh, uh, input and feedback from the market on on this. Um, certainly, there have been instances, and there have been some. Uh, fortunately, not larger claims, but a few claims here and there um, of how container packing, container stuffing has gone affected because of uh, because of the severe crunch at the moment. We we saw. Um, we saw a lot of smaller shippers uh, unfortunately trying to cut corners because as i was mentioning earlier the cost of shipping a container if it goes down five to six goes up five to six times of what it used to be there is not much margins for uh, these shippers to play around with and they has to they have to try and somehow factor this cost if they can pass it to the end consumer great but uh, more often than not uh, there are this means that unfortunately some corners have been cut um, this goes into uh, packing qualities. This goes into the way they are using the containers, and one of the more dangerous uh, result of this is that some of the containers uh, which were normally uh, taken out of service because of the quality and age and everything have, have also been put back into service because of the severe shortage what we have seen of containers, and um, that unfortunately can only mean that we will have sooner or later a um, few further losses coming in because of the industry. I'll also take this opportunity to mention one of the other trends that uh, uh, that we've seen is that containers are now being loaded onto bulk carriers because of the lack of space on container vessels. I mean, if you look at what the charter rates for container vessels are today, we are looking at 200,000 per day for a 7, 7 to 8,000 EU vessel, which are astronomical. So for such uh, such high rates, uh, it is not surprising that some some shippers have decided, well, we could utilize the bulk carrier space to ship containers. But uh, as in some of our earlier publications we have mentioned, these vessels are not meant to carry containers. They can be made, but that would require approvals from class, proper risk mitigation measures, risk assessment as to where this can, things can go wrong. Um, and uh, if that has not been done properly, unfortunately, this will again lead to further problems and, and, and losses. Great. Uh, thank you, Rahul. And maybe staying with, with ARC for a moment, and uh, this, this this might be a question for you as well, Rahul, and possibly also for you just to comment. We have two questions here on cyber. Uh, so the first one is, do you think that uh, cyber losses on ships will increase in the future? And sorry, there was just another question submitted while I was reading, which... Uh, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> Uh, so, do you think that cyber losses on ships will increase in the future? And if yes, do you think that uh, claims handlers will look at claims from a different angle? So, in particular regarding cyber and losses, uh, what's your what's your take on the exposure and uh, and and where this is heading? I think uh, there was another question similar to to this that uh, which said, has there would the industry need a significant cyber loss to actually 
wake yeah. up and motivate exactly. the shipowners. I think I'll, we can take both of them together saying that uh, fortunately for the shipping industry, we haven't seen a major loss because of cyber at sea or on board a ship really so far. But that doesn't mean that that cannot happen. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, studies. In fact, there in, in fact there have been some spoofing attempts done by some ethical hackers, if there is such a term, um, who have tried to show that uh, using very little resources, you could actually spoof a vessel's GPS position. And, and, uh, and the result was that uh, the crew members actually started to deviate the vessel from its course, thinking they were not where they were. And, and that, that means that there is always this, this big fear that a major cyber incident can happen if the onboard systems on board ships can be hacked by somebody. Uh, the worst case scenario could be, unfortunately, a terrorist organization or, or, or some, some that organization uh, even taking control of a vessel. But these are these are scenarios that have been thought about but haven't happened yet. yet. And then we, we certainly hope it doesn't happen. But uh, looking at the shoreside organization, in fact, only last week, uh, we, we saw another major shipping line coming in, uh, coming under the cyber attack. And uh, they, we've seen at least uh, five, seven major attacks on shipping companies and their systems on shore, whether it was booking systems or these were systems with, of cargo uh, cargo bookings on board and major shipping lines, including some of the big names that we have in the industry. And this should be enough of an impetus for the industry to start standing up and thinking about this is a real, real threat at the moment. We don't know the extent of the last week's attack, how much it is going to be, but previous attacks have meant hundreds of millions of dollars of losses in, for the shipping companies. And uh, I, I think there is no need for any further uh, incident to happen for the industry to wake up. I think it's already out there for us to just take notice and start doing something about it. IMO had asked uh, passed a resolution that we, into the safety management system of every company, you should have procedures on how to uh, how to address this issue, how to mitigate if there is a uh, if there is a, a cyber attack on board a vessel or in in the shoreside organization, and, and those regulations are already in force now. Companies are required to submit plans, but I think we probably need to do a little bit more uh, to make sure and ring fence this issue. Because uh, personally, I feel this is something which uh, which can have a massive impact if there is a major incident. Yeah, very good. Justus, do you have any additional thoughts on on the two questions from an underwriting perspective? Mm, yep, I think uh, one industry alone, meaning the insurance industry, will not be able to cover that risk because due to the accumulation of, of these scenarios, it will simply not be possible. So that is also the reason why we are pushed by reinsurers and also from group level um, not to be silent on cyber and to have exclusionary language in our policies, which is a standard for the whole market, so not an HCS-specific thing, as we all know. Um, when we try to launch products uh, with a limited scope of cover in terms of uh, yeah, um, um, limits provided, but still having something to offer, uh, and also having an, uh, an element of additional service and ad hoc help, we, we had to experience that um, even if uh, brokers and clients were asking for it, no one was really happy to pay premium for it. So uh, the interest was there for such a product, and we all know that there are three or four in, in the market still, uh, and, and some of them are, are more successful. But in the end of the day, um, it was quite obvious that um, yeah, the readiness from, from clients to buy a marine health-specific cyber cover is quite limited. And what we see now is that maybe the demand for a combined onshore, offshore cover uh, will increase, and this is for sure something we will need to discuss and observe with, with our clients and brokers and to see in how far this can be tackled by marine health insurance or in how far this needs to be tackled by a broader scope of cover, meaning a more combined policy. Very good. Okay, thank you, Eustace. Um, moving on, um, uh, there's an interesting question here uh, from one of the participants, participants on data. During the London International Shipping, it was uh, a lot was said on the use of data and algorithms by underwriters to determine premiums 
for fleets, which from an owner's perspective is not the way forward and wipes out the relationship that existed in the past. How can we tackle this and find a more balanced solution? So it's uh, an underwriting question. So Justus, uh, if it's okay to put you on the spot or uh, I can comment a bit as well from, from, from my perspective. I'm, I'm very sorry there was an interruption in, in, in my line. If you can summarize briefly again the question, that would be great. Sorry for that. Yeah, sure. So it's it's on data and, and algorithms that, that this is really one of the trends here on the underwriting side uh, to use data and to use algorithms to determine premium for fleets. And then we have the question from, I guess, one of the owners here of, 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 uh, of a fleet. Uh, um, so from the owner's perspective, this is not the way forward and wipes out the relationships that existed in the past. How can we tackle this and find a more balanced solution? So it's for sure not our intention to destroy uh, or question any existing relationships. Um, it's something from my point of view where underwriting has to go when we want to be more clever and more transparent on pricing. And it does not mean when using other sources of data and identifying other KPIs that this will question the existing business model and the existing uh, relationship with an account. It will just put another perspective in the discussion. And um, there will be no automation in the underwriting process to say, here's the tool, here's the price and the underwriter is uh, becoming just a salesperson and, and underwriting does not take place anymore. Maybe this is also a thought behind, uh, if I can just guess. Um, so this is, I think, a very important message. We, we try to develop our underwriting approach. I think the whole market is trying to do so, to become more clever. And um, in the end of the day, it's a matter of a frank discussion with brokers and clients on premium and how we come to the premium number uh, might be not as important for the client in the end. I think the clients will continue to benchmark the number in the end against uh, other offers. And we will be better positioned to argue for our number. This is our hope. Yeah. And uh, maybe Rahul, you also have a have a comment there. Uh, just to, just to add from 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 my perspective, uh, as um, the use of data is you know not just for the marine uh, area. Uh, one of the key items we're we're looking at. Um, it's just uh, you know as a corporate and specialty insurer, we're investing quite a bit into making use of that as well. Um, and so we will as well uh, for our marine hull and also for our marine cargo underwriting uh, do that in the future. But I, I'm, I'm personally seeing this uh, very, very optimistic because to me this is uh, uh, really just another very powerful tool uh, uh, for us to understand risks and then also for our clients and brokers to, to, to have a much deeper insight into what is driving exposure uh, and what is maybe not all that all that relevant. So, and it can go both ways. It can be uh, that uh, if if the data shows us and we have evidence uh, from a claims perspective that that a certain fleet is actually much better than what we thought it was, that has positive impact on pricing. And it also, of course, can go the other way uh, that uh, you know that we do view a certain risk to be uh, inherent with. The, with higher exposure and, and to be warranting a higher price. But the good thing about this data is then that we can, and maybe this is the point where you want to comment Rahul as well, also provide transparency and clarity to our clients and brokers on what are these drivers, you know, what can be done from a risk management perspective to reduce exposure and hence the, the risk and also the ultimate insurance price. Uh, so in my view, this does not at all uh, or it's not meant at all to replace a relationship. In fact, this is what Allianz is looking for sp specifically. We do want and we do look for uh, long-standing relationships where we go through good and through bad times and uh, you know help our clients uh, become better at risk management and, and are there for them uh, in case of a claim. 
and when there's not, work with us to improve the risk. Uh, Rahul, do you have any other additional comments on use of data and maybe with a specific focus on risk management? Yeah, I think um, Rick, uh, you and your sister have summed it up quite nicely as to where, what, how we see the addition of data uh, and analytics within our underwriting processes. Um, I, I personally don't think that this is going to be the, that marine industry or any specialty industry is going to go down the route of car insurance or home insurance where you can put in the details and, and you can get a get a premium out. That that simply is not going to happen uh, as, as far as I can see. Uh, there is this personal element. Shipping industry has always been based on relationships and that I think will continue very strongly and more so when we can share information with our clients on what we think the risk profile is. And in many cases, data is not always, uh, uh, you know, giving us the true picture. It depends on the data quality. But I think this will enhance the discussions, the, the conversation between us and our clients to, to understand a lot more about the risk. There's a lot we can, we can understand. There might be some actual insights that we can draw from the data, which we can share back with our clients, which, might, which, might, which our clients might find quite useful. So I can only see positives out of this, uh, the, the, the use of data and analytics uh, in, in terms of more conversation, more transparency, having more insights on how the risk is, and maybe even uh, more opportunities to improve the risk when we identify. In fact, to, uh, to solve a problem, the first thing is to you know what the problem is. And, and in these cases, we might actually have a little more insights on what, what may be there to be improved. So I, I think it's, it's all positive from, from my perspective. Yeah, yeah, okay. So at least the panel is aligned. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, next question. Maybe, Justus, this is again for you uh, on additional products. So there's a question here. Uh, any additional covers introduced in marine underwriting to cover the financial losses due to delay delayed shipments as a result of COVID-19? There have been requests in that regard, um, and the traditional loss of hire insurance is linked to a physical loss in short under the H&M cover. And from uh, our point of view, this should continue because just having a pure financial loss cover in place is, uh, say, a product which is not in scope of our underwriting and uh, risk management focus. This is something where we can well understand the need from a client perspective to get such a cover, but we are again tapping then into the trap of accumulation, like we discussed on cyber. So um, from an AGCS perspective, this won't be at this point in time a cover we are looking for um, impl implementation. Yeah, that's right. In the end, and just from an industry perspective, obviously, we're introducing, since the question was specific on COVID-19, exclusions on communicable disease covers. So, uh, so whether it's financial loss or physical damage loss, uh, the intent is not to cover uh, uh, losses as a result of the pandemic because of the set accumulation. It could be specialized covers out there. Uh, um, in the various markets that, that do provide that, but it is the overall Allianz uh, um, uh, underwriting philosophy to uh, focus on the core products. And, and we currently do not have plans uh, to have a pandemic specific uh, cover uh, developed. There's one more question on cyber and then we probably have to wrap things up. Um, so coming back to cyber, do you think there will be a higher attention uh, to focus on cyber exclusion clauses when it comes engine breakdowns, when it comes to, I guess that means, when it comes to engine breakdowns and related claims. So let me read this again. Do you think there will be a higher attention to focus on cyber exclusion clauses when it comes to engine breakdowns and related claims? Yes, this is an underwriting question. Um, well, it could be both you and Rahul, I guess. Uh, maybe Rahul, yeah, Rahul can please. <laughs> maybe Rahul, uh, you know, uh, from an exposure perspective, uh, engine breakdowns and related claims, I guess uh, that's something you can comment on. And then, you know, will there be higher attention on it? We can cover from, from an underwriting perspective. 
Yeah, uh, maybe, I mean, as I was saying earlier on this, we, we really haven't seen um, a physical loss on board on board ships because of a cyber hack or cyber attack. So uh, this is something very new that we, if that happens, then yes, how do we deal with this? Uh, the issue is always going to be linking the damage to a cyber incident. So whether the, the incident actually happened because of a cyber attack or not, or because of a cyber issue or not. Um, that itself is, is one of the big issues. Uh, so, so linking the two is one big problem. Um, I certainly haven't heard of any major claim that has come in because of a cyber attack and this has resulted in, in, in an engine damage or, or something. So the cyber exclusion clause, I think just as you can comment a little bit more on this uh, as to how it works. But for, for me, I think um, keeping the onboard systems sanitized um, uh, is, is going to be the priority that the shipping industry needs to it, especially when a lot of automation is now uh, increasingly coming in. We're also now talking about com fully autom autonomous ships and how do they get impacted by cyber attacks is something that we need to think about and how does that translate into policy wording that structure is, is, is something that we eventually have to be working with. And just as uh, you, you remember, we are uh, having some conversations on, on a project that we are working on to try and see if we can uh, provide assistance on a completely autonomous dredger project that we are on to 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 learn from that as to what challenges we will face when drafting a policy uh, if we have a completely auto, auto, autonomous ships. But there are many issues there, um, many many complex issues that will come to light when when coming into that. Um, but on the on the clauses, I think you just uh, probably a best to, best place to comment. Yeah, and, and uh, maybe. Oh. Very short since we're already one yeah. minute over and have to wrap At this up. stage, no plan because the drivers for machinery issues are different to be short. Okay, good. So with that, we're out of time, uh, actually one minute over. So I just want to say a big thanks to everyone who attended. Hopefully you found this session to be helpful and interesting. You can, of course, reach out to all of the panelists if you have questions uh, regarding the content here or if you have uh, uh, certain risks uh, where uh, you would appreciate uh, the ADCS view and insight. Uh, of course, our underwriting team is uh, ready to respond and, uh, and help you out. Uh, and with that said, uh, again, many thanks uh, today. Uh, for for spending the time with us. Uh, don't forget to access a copy of the report, uh, which is available online uh, on our website, the Safety and Shipping Review. Um, and uh, there will, I think, uh, also be a poll uh, submitted uh, where you can share a bit of feedback, what went well, what didn't go so well, so we can do a uh, even better job next time. So thanks very much. We'll close with this and have a great day. <laughs>